Good morning, bienvenidos todos. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are happy to have you uh, with us. And uh, we are starting our presentation in a couple minutes. Uh, we just want to uh, show to you our disclaimer for our event. Thank you very much for that. Good morning and welcome once again uh, to our panel, Drawing the Line, How Redistricting Impacts Latino Communities in Connecticut. My name is Janice Velez. I'm the New England Regional Director at Hispanic Federation. And we are proud to host this panel with our special guest. Hispanic Federation has a strong commitment to language justice, and therefore we will make this video recording available through our social media with a Spanish voice over. We wanna make sure that every one of you are participating in this discussion. Therefore, we also ask you to please place your questions on our chat throughout the event. At the end of the event, we will have an opportunity for you to be able to address your questions and concerns or feedback. Every state legislator is unique. So it's critical to understand what our state does and how it works. Legislators in each of the 50 states address issues that directly touch our lives, frequently debating even more important matters than those addressed in Washington, D.C. The goal of redistricting is to create and maintaining voting, voting districts that adhere to the one person, one vote principle. The redistricting process can appear complicated or even difficult to comprehend at times. With this in mind, we have invited three experts to discuss the redistricting process in Connecticut and its impact in the Latino community. Please join me in welcoming our guest. First, John Twins, Director at Large People Power for Maps. Thank you so much for joining us. To represent the League of Women Voters in Connecticut. The League of Women Voters in Connecticut is committed to promoting effective public policy and informed participation of citizens in government. The League of Women Voters in Connecticut will empower local leagues to promote voter participation, serve voters, and preserve good governance locally. Thank you once again. Next, we have Fulvia Vargas. Hi, Fulvia. Associate Council of Latino Justice. Latina justice works to create a more just society by using and challenging the rule of law to secure transformative, equitable, and accessible justice by empowering our community and by fostering leadership through advocacy and education. Thank you, Fulvia. Next, we have Dorian Powell. He is the Director of Civic Engagement Research at Naleo Educational Fund. Naleo Educational Fund is the national leading 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that facilitates full Latino participation in the American political process from citizenship to public service. But before we go with them, I want to share with you a special message from our representative, Juan Candelaria. Please, let's join. Hello, my name is Juan Candelaria, and I'm the state representative for the 95th district. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Hispanic Federation, Latino Justice, League of Women Voters, and NALEO for putting this important forum together. I think it's critical that we engage in the conversation of redistricting and the impact it has on the Latino community. We need to engage in this conversation to ensure that everyone is knowledgeable about the importance of redistricting and how important it is for us to have a seat at the table. Sometimes we have to sit back and think out who are the leaders that are at the table drawing these lines? Are they inclusive of our community? Maybe, maybe not. But we need to engage in that process. And the only way we can do that is by participating. We need to involve our community, create awareness of the importance of redistricting and help resources 
come to our state through the federal government. Why is it important that every person is counted? Those conversations need to happen and we need to create the awareness. For instance, we have never had a successful candidate for statewide office. That is the problem. Maybe our parties are not taking us seriously, or maybe we need to induce our party to ensure that we have a Latino candidate. But we need to do that as a community. That's the only way it's gonna happen. We need to introduce ourselves into that conversation. The other issue that we have is at the national level, we are undercounted by at least 5%. That has an impact on the districts and the drawing of those districts. So we need to participate and be part of that process. Now, if we're not at the table, others will be making that decision for us. And who's gonna be at a loss? Our community. Because it's gonna be more difficult to get our people elected into office. An office to ensure that they make an impact on people's lives. So my message to all of you is, please, be inclusive. Please participate. Please let your voices be heard. Let's make the process work for all of us. I want to again thank everyone for putting this together and I'm so sorry I couldn't be with you today. Thank you so much. And we are grateful for this message and also um, we wanted to say thank you to the Connecticut Network who is doing the Dream Life of our event today. Now let's start with a conversation. And first I wanted to invite our panelist, John. John, you have been working at the local level to empower voters to participate with confidence in our government process. And most recently, I know that the League of Women Voter has created a program since 2019, I believe, which included the practice of gerrymandering as a voter suppression tactic. Tell us about that program and how this redistricting process went in Connecticut. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Janice, and thank you to the Hispanic Federation for inviting the League uh, to be a part of this important panel today. I want to start by saying that the League is a 102-year-old membership organization open to all people. We are organized at the national, state, and local levels. The League is nonpartisan, meaning we don't support or oppose uh, political candidates or political parties. We do take action in support of our policy positions such as voter rights. The People Powered Fair Maps campaign, which has been a three-year campaign, is a national initiative of the League to engage the public in the redistricting process. Uh, next slide. The League believes that voters should choose their representatives and not the other way around. We also believe the process should be open and transparent. We tie redistricting to voter rights and participation in the voting process. When districts are gerrymandered, voters drop out of the process, they conclude their votes don't matter. And that is why uh, we do tie uh, gerrymandering to as a form of voter suppression. Here in Connecticut, the redistricting process is set in our constitution. It is a bipartisan process of the State General Assembly, and it includes a timetable and escalation procedures when the legislative uh, committee are, uh, may be unable to uh, reach agreement. In 2021, legislative leaders agreed on the State House and Senate districts, but they were not able to agree on the five U.S. House districts. Thus, in early 2022, before the deadline, the Connecticut Supreme Court appointed a special master with instructions to adjust those districts only to achieve the criterion of population equality, which is set in uh, the Constitution, the US Constitution. Next slide, please. So how did we do in relation to the League's point of view? On both public input and process transparency, Connecticut's process can be much improved. In this last redistricting cycle, four public hearings were held and they were called with very little notification. And after the hearings, there are no official pathways through which the public can be heard. And then moreover, in terms of transparency, the Connecticut process is quite opaque, uh, which is of course the opposite of transparent. Uh, the public is not given a chance to comment on any draft maps that could be under review by the leaders. 
We don't know anything about the new maps until they are released in final form. So in conclusion, the Connecticut process is closely held by the legislature and is completed behind closed doors and those processes are set in our state constitution. So, so these are, here are the Connecticut district maps for the state Senate and the state house. And Connecticut is a small state of about three and a half million people. However, we have 169 towns. We have 36 Senate districts and 151 state house districts. And you can learn more about the Connecticut process that I briefly described and also learn more about the makeup of these districts uh, by checking out the resources that I believe uh, Selena has put into uh, the chat today. The resources include a blog series that I wrote about the details of the process, as well as links to the actual new maps that will go into effect in the November elections, and a link to an online uh, utility called Dave's Redistricting App, which provides a lot of content and background about the population in each of these districts. So thank you very much. Thank you, this is great information. And, and I think in a nutshell provides an update of um, you know, what has been happening here in the state of Connecticut in terms of the redistricting process. Um, and yes, we will be providing these resources and information, additional information on our chat. And I want to take this opportunity to remind you, our audience that you are more than welcome to share your comments and questions on the chat. And at the end of the event, we will be able to address those questions. Once again, thank you, Joan. And now I think that we have a preamble of this conversation so we can invite Dorian to talk about what is the impact of the redistricting process in the state of Connecticut for the Latino community per se. Dorian, welcome. Great, thank you, Aniti, and it's a, a pleasure to be with everyone uh, here in a distinguished panel. Um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to cover is just really to put it into context, right, with regards to uh, the redistricting process, particularly the growth of the Latino community, certainly. Um, Aniti, if you can put the slide. So one of the things that we know is that it, uh, Latinos have, have had tremendous growth throughout the country, um, and certainly Connecticut is no different. Uh, when we look at the total population growth, uh, we see that about 3.57 million in 2010, and then that grew to about 3.6 million, increasing roughly about 0.9%. That's just 0.9%, right? When we compare that to the Latino population growth, uh, we see that it's about 479,000 in 2010, and then that grew to 623,000 uh, for 2020. When we look at the population groups, one of the things that we see is that Latinos do exceed the growth of other population groups. Um, not only that, but when we look at the white alone population had a decrease of more than 267,000 in uh, between 2010 and 2020. Uh, certainly other population groups grew a little, uh, a little and certainly the Asian Pacific Islander communities and certainly the two or more race category. Uh, next slide. And certainly the share has grown within the, uh, the state. One of the things that we see is that in 2010, the share of the population, the total population of Latinos was 13.4%, and that grew to about 17.3% for 2020. Uh, we see that there was, again, the decline in the white share of the population from 71 to 63.2%. And there was some growth in other populations, certainly the Black or African American, and also the Asian Pacific Islander uh, communities. Next slide. So what can we say about the adult and youth population? One of the things that we see in other states is that the uh, Latino population is a younger community. And certainly Connecticut is no different when we know that uh, roughly about 192,000 Latinos are under 18, or that's about 30.9% of the total Latino population with 430,000 being 18 and older or 69.1%. So that means that over one quarter, 26.2, 26.1 rather of all Connecticut's under 18 are Latino. That's a sizable number of, of, of uh, within the community. However, one of the things that we do know is that there, there was a lot of indications during the census count that um, you know, communities of color certainly and Latinos uh, weren't being counted in the same way that other communities were being counted. And what we saw is that the, the Census Bureau did estimate that there was an undercount of Latinos of 4.99% more than triple the undercount of the census 2020, uh, 2010 rather. 
And we also know that uh, Latinos, certainly the younger Latinos, zero to four, also had a uh, net undercount, certainly in 2010. And in 2020, it seems that, that it's, it's a lot bigger, uh, more than triple the undercount in census 20, uh, than 2010 compared to 2010. Uh, more than one of every four American children are Latino. So certainly, uh, not only is this uh, a, 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 an issue, certainly, but also very important to understand and continue to understand. Next slide. So what about the electorate? You know, we've already seen the total population, but with regards to the voting age citizen population, meaning those that are eligible uh, over 18, 320,000 Latinos, or roughly about 12.2% share of the total voting age population is Latino. One of the other things that we do know is that the registered voters, uh, total registered voters, about 2.2 million uh, Latino registered voters is 213,000 or a share of 9.7%. So certainly a sizable uh, a group of the registered population and certainly the voting age population is Latino as we see from these numbers. Next slide. And again, just looking at age breakdowns and certainly when we look at and, and what I've mentioned before with regards to Latinos being younger, um, the 18 to 24 population, when we look at it from the Latino uh, uh, perspective, uh, the share of the 18 to 24 uh, Latino population of the total Latino population is 13.7 compared to 8.8%. And we also see this very similar pattern in the 25 to 34, and then certainly the 35 to 49, where it's, um, in 35, 49, you know, it's, it's pretty much the, the same um, with regards to 28.3% share. But when we look at the 25, point, uh, 25 to 34 range, rather, it's 21.3% for Latino and 14.6%. That is very different when we look at 50 plus. Uh, when we look at it, the non-Latino population, it's more than half are 50 or older, while Latinos, it's just roughly around 36% um, um, the share of the total registered population. Next slide. <clears throat> so what does this mean for um, the Latino population? Certainly one of the things that we've seen and certainly what has been already been covered by Joanne is the growth of the uh, Latino population is critical uh, uh, for the state. Uh, not only that, but we also know that the continued growth of the electorate uh, will continue to grow. So uh, the Latino voter turnout must keep pace with that growth. And I think this is really key. When we look, when we actually think about the electorate growing and Latino population growing, one of the things that we also see is that the registered population certainly continues to grow, uh, but it's not keeping pace with the overall voting age population. And we also know that the turnout um, is in keeping pace. And certainly we see this uh, trend in other states as well. So again, candidates in both political parties and also organizations must continue to invest significant resources to sustain uh, mobilization for, Latino, for the Latino population as a whole. And certainly youth is really important and key. Next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Dorian, so based on the growth of the Latino community, um, in terms of the impact on the redistricting, um, what does that mean really for the people who really do not understand this process that much or is new in this process? How is that truly impacted or correlated directly? Yeah, so certainly, you know, when we're, when we're talking about representation and when we're talking about the, the, the growth of Latino population, certainly I think those are, 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 are correlative, right? So one of the things that we always say is that given the growth of the Latino population, it is critical that states and localities move forward uh, in, 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 and continue to move forward, right? With thinking about redistricting and certainly in the future um, uh, in taking into account not only the growth, right? but also ensuring that Latinos have fair opportunities to elect the candidates who are responsive and accountable to their needs. Especially when we consider the fact that the youth population is, is sizable within the Latino community, ensuring that uh, not only the, the, the policies, not only ensuring that when we're thinking about the, 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 uh, the, the districts, that all of that, again, is taking into account that growth of the Latino community. Considering the fact that a sizable chunk, right, of that growth was attributed to the Latino population, certainly the, the, the district and so forth, and the way that we're thinking about it should take into account that. Um, and I, I think that's really key. And I think that's going to be really key moving forward, certainly when we're looking to 2030. 
But, you know, in between now, I think it's really critical to continue to invest the resources, as I mentioned in my last slide, around um, the investment around the electorate, right? Ensuring that Latinos are going out and voting. You know, the, the, you know, the lines are already drawn. Uh, we already know what, what it looks like. But again, how do we sort of sustain that mobilization for the Latino community that, you know, again, hasn't been really uh, outreach to, right? It hasn't been engaged. Um, so I think this is a, a clear opportunity um, uh, knowing that we can do that and we can continue to do that with, within the Latino community. Thank you, Dorian. And I think that um, our next panelist will get into a much deeper in terms of the impact of our Latino community uh, moving forward, right, for the long run. And for that, I want to invite Fulvia from Latino Justice, who will actually explain a little bit more in detail um, what is the district process is specifically for the Latino community for the next 10 years. Fulvia? Thank you, Nipi. I think one of the things that I think Dorian and Joanne have highlighted is that the population has increased. That's without a doubt that we are a growing, a significantly growing population in Connecticut. Um, I think that's not coming as a surprise to anyone. I think for the next decade, it's going to continue to grow. The issue that we find um, is that even if, even as we see the Latino population grow, and we've seen it over the last two decades, actually, um, we don't see that growth in population actualized into political power. Um, and so we see very little representation in local governments. We see very little representation at the state and federal level. Um, and so really it's hammering that point that Dorian just mentioned, which is, all right, the population is growing. It's a young population. It's a population that, you know, is, you know, the 18 plus population is significantly and able to vote or able to register to vote. Um, but where, where, what's the missing link? Um, and that's something that I think over the next decade, we definitely have to work on. It's really uh, shifting that population increase into political representation and what that looks like for our government. Um, oftentimes we look at state, you know, and federal representation, but even on the local level, which I think is vital for the Latino community to really focus on the ground, right? Where they're located, where there's this density of Latino population, for us to really think about how can we empower those within our local communities to you know, either vote or run for office um, and to elect candidates of their choice and to make sure their voices are heard. Um, I always emphasize the need to be a significant voting block, right? Because as elected officials see who's out there voting, those are the ones that they campaign for, right? Those are the ones that they go out to the community and take that extra time. Um, and so it's so, so vital for these communities to really start empowering themselves to understand the the mass the mass amount of power they hold in this population increase and what that can mean for the next decade in Connecticut. Um, I also remind communities, I know we talk a lot about voting and sometimes for the Latino community, even as we are increasing in population and we are becoming significant voting blocks, there is also this disconnect about the importance of voting. Um, feeling like it doesn't make a difference, feeling like ah, it's just one single vote, right? But if elections have taught us anything in the last couple of years is that those single votes, they start adding up, right? And so um, I feel like as advocates, we have a duty to communicate to our community that those votes matter. They make significant differences at all levels of government now. Um, it's not sufficient to say, well, you know, I'm not going to go out to vote because that decision impacts your neighbor and impacts your other family members. Um, and so in Connecticut, to me, the importance over the next decade is shifting that population growth to political power um, and really emphasizing to the community the power that they hold to be decisive, um, to be a decisive voting block within the Connecticut, Connecticut politics, to be elected into office, to have that representation that is much needed so that community members have elected officials who understand their needs and are responsive to their needs. Thank you, Rubia. And that, and that goes back to the principle, right? A one person, one vote, and one vote really matters. Um, one of the things is that in terms of the, the, the growing population and the representation of the, um, of the uh, Latino, right? In the political arena, it's also the resources that are um, lacking or maybe will be limited 
due to the um, census information and redistricting, uh, redrawing those lines. Um, what we can do um, moving forward, in your opinion, um, in order for us to participate, but more specifically, how we can participate? How can we kind of uh, demand a more transparent process so that person, that vote, can also be part of the process in the registry? I think the only way you demand more is by being a voice, a being an active voice. It's it's not sufficient to just be a number. I think census we talk about numbers and population increases, but it's not sufficient anymore. Um, these community members really need to come out and speak up, um, and really emphasize the needs of those communities. I think you said it perfectly. I mean, there is this. There, there was a significant undercount early in the 2020 census. There's a lot of community members who were not counted. Um, but it's still really important to really use your voice, really go out and hold elected officials accountable to, commu to your community because that's who's voted to represent you, right? Um, there has to be some accountability that we empower our communities to do to hold elected officials accountable for any actions that's related to the community. So I think that's one of the most important things um, that we can do and start, and start working on in the next decade. Um, I also think that you know, we do a lot of census work at the end of the decade, right? Um, a lot of it takes place, you know, 2029, we are all going to be scrambling, we're all going to be knocking on doors. And it works, you know, for the most part. But I think this process has to be ongoing, right? Voter engagement, census count, it can't just happen at the end of the decade. Um, it has to be a continuous process that as community members, as organizers, we continuously engage in with folks, that we continuously remind them of the importance, that we emphasize you know, the difference that it makes to funding for local communities, um, really make them active at every stage and not just you know, parachute in and scramble at the end of the decade to emphasize the importance. Because at that point, you know, it feels more like it's, it's urgent, I guess I should do it, but there's not really an understanding of the why behind we do a census count the way I think we should be emphasizing to our community members. And I think, uh, Fulvia, to your point, um, it's not only about knowing, it's understanding. And this is why this type of conversation are so important in our community. Yes, of course, after the pandemic, we are doing hybrid models, we are doing virtual events, but it is very important to provide the ease information for our citizens and residents in the state um, and at a national level as well, you know, for every individual to understand how the government works, how every process in the government that takes place and, and make a huge impact in our daily lives um, in starts, right? And I want to go back to Dorian, but Dorian, just hold a minute because I know that Naleo Educational Fund has been working as we have um, on the census at the national level for many years. But let me go back first to Joanne. Joanne, you guys as a legal woman voter have a, a more specific uh, kind of a position and a strategy of how we can improve this process in the state of Connecticut. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, uh, thank you, and, and um, uh, there is another slide associated with that, but before I uh, speak to that, I do want to um, uh, also emphasize something that's been alluded to a couple of times regarding um, the, the population equality criterion for districts. So districts of at whatever level, whether it's the U.S. House or the state st Senate or the state House, have to be uh, of substantially equal in their population size. And the point of emphasis I want to make is that is the entire population. It is all of the residents. It's not uh, citizens, it's not voters, it's everyone who lives in the state. And that is why, one of the reasons why the census is such an important uh, process because those are the numbers that are used then to establish this uh, constitutional criterion of population equality. And that criterion hasn't always been in effect. It's been in effect since the 1960s when a variety of court cases uh, brought it um, uh, to, uh, to its existence. Before that, um, 
uh, districts could be of unequal size. And the example that I use is imagine a district of a thousand people right next to a district of a hundred people. And you can see quite readily that the people who are in the hundred people district size have more access to their government. It's easier for them. There are a few of them. So in that way, they're overrepresented when they both have one uh, resident. So that, con that, that criterion was uh, established in the 1960s that it's population uh, equality that districts need to have. And that is, of course, the League does support those uh, three criteria there, Equal Population, Voting Rights Act, which, uh, of course, has been undermined uh, uh, since 2013, and uh, contiguity, geographic contiguity. But the League supports independent redistricting commissions, non-political redistricting commissions, as the best way to keep the public, all of the public, at the center of redistricting. And that is another reason uh, uh, both Dorian and Fulvia have spoken so well about the importance of activism. That is a, a key criterion to move that uh, forward. It's, it will be a heavy lift in Connecticut because our process is established in uh, the Connecticut Constitution. And uh, we know that legislative leaders are not eager to release that, um, that, that process. So that's a challenge for uh, Connecticut. The League also su supports uh, which is Voting Rights uh, Act, effective representation of linguistic and racial minorities. And in Connecticut, we do have uh, a number of racial uh, minority, majority districts uh, in, the, in the state house. And then preservation of communities of interest. And we oppose the preferential treatment of uh, political parties or um, incumbents. So I think there's one, yes. There's one last slide, which is yes. this again, the core message that really summarizes it all, that voters should choose their representatives rather than the other way around. And um, those are the criteria that we would like to see in place, transparency, public input throughout, and independent uh, commissions. And it's very important to, uh, re again, repeat that uh, the ger gerrymandering is tied as a form of voter suppression in that it discourages voters uh, from participation when in fact uh, we need all, well, all, all people actually to be engaged and all uh, eligible voters also to of course uh, be engaged in the voting process uh, per se. And one last point I'd like to make, which is I've been inspired by this panel today and would love to be talking with you afterwards about how we as the league might be able to help provide some uh, resources that you that you might be able to use further. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, and I'm sure that um, we will continue to include those resources in our chat. As well, we will continue to provide more information about the organizations and the panelists that has been uh, throughout this event with us. It is important that we um, highlight that um, after a census, for those who don't know, after census, there is a process of redistricting. And um, one with the other is called related to the impact, direct impact of our communities um, on resources, representation, and really um, what we're looking here is to highlight how this year, this process went in the state of Connecticut and more important, what does that mean for the next years and how we can provide uh, potential recommendations and work together to better the process for the next decade. Um, when you talk about, um, hey, Dorian, when you talk about census and redistricting, you're already talking about 2030, right? And um, it seems that it's going to take a long journey for us to prepare, but really it's a multi-year preparation um, because it is a multi-year impact uh, when we when we think about it, how how you think that based on the preparation and the work that Naleo Educational Fund did around census and then later on redistricting, we should prepare for twenty thirty. Yeah, so th there's a couple of things, right? I, I think you know it, it's been said you know by by not only Joanne and certainly Fulvia with regards to you know how uh, census data is, is certainly used to to apportion not only U.S. House of Representatives and, and certainly uh, uh, for other re redistricting efforts as well and drawing the lines. 
Um, one of the key things here is that because it is being used for that, you know, certainly the count itself is, is highly important. Uh, we know that the Latino community has been undercounted in the past, and certainly there is every indication, and certainly the data that I've shared also indicates that there was an undercount for the 2020 census as well. And then certainly one of the key things to be able to look at when looking forward, right, 2030, is starting with the actual process of counting every single uh, uh, person in the U.S. Uh, through, the, through, through the decennial census. And one of the key th things there is ensuring that that process is continually improved, right? Um, making sure that when the Bureau uh, you know, uh, does the process again and, and counts every uh, uh, person in the United States, that they're doing it in a way that, that it ensures that it captures every single individual. Um, that it captures every community, especially the communities that have been undercounted in, in, in the past and continue to be undercounted. So being involved in that process is going to be highly critical. Uh, you know, certainly the Bureau has been really good at, at incorporating stakeholder feedback and, and just generally uh, been involved in, in, in really uh, discussing how, you know, all of this can be improved. Um, so that's really one key element, right, it is really trying to look at it from that perspective and improving that count and continuing to improve that count, knowing that there are some deficits. I think the second thing is certainly with regards to the, the, um, the uh, data that we have is certainly how are we gonna mitigate uh, what we think and what we see with regards to the undercount, particularly as it pertains to uh, the distribution of more than 1.5 trillion in annual federal uh, funding. Um, you know, and, and certainly because census data is, is, is used to be able to determine um, how uh, funding uh, goes to states and, and, and states and other localities, it's really important to be able to understand not only what the magnitude was, not only at the national level, uh, but also at the state level and beyond. Um, and then the other thing is, of, of course, how do we then mitigate that, right? Uh, we know that there was an unaccount 4.9% per, uh, uh, at the national level. But what about the, the, the lower geographies? Actually, right now, the Bureau is releasing new information on the post-enumeration survey, which goes into uh, an analysis of what the undercount uh, it was. Uh, um, uh, and, and it's basically an extension of what was already released at the national level, but they're doing it at the state level. However, this information does not include any demographic breakdown. That means that while we're gonna know a little bit more about the state and a little bit more of, a, of, of, of the state level, uh, um, uh, uh, undercount, we won't know it for specific groups that we know are undercounted. And therefore, continue to understand that and, and encouraging, again, the Census Bureau to continue to look at ways to evaluate that and understand that is going to be really critical um, for not only for future planning, right, because I think it's important for that, but also, as I mentioned, for the uh, distribution of funds that are, are really critical for every single jurisdiction across the, entire, uh, the United States. Thank you, Dorian. And I think nobody else has, you know, can express that better. You know, um, I think that what I want is to really identify and um, going back is specifically about redistricting. It's in the state of Connecticut, uh, we have seen that, first of all, the deadline was passed once again. It was kind of the same similar behavior from the last um, decade. Moving forward, and the state of Connecticut and Fulvia, Joan, please feel free to, to jump in and to expand this line of thought is how our people can actually be more involved. Because yes, we're saying we need transparency, we need uh, people to be involved, but really what are those practices and ways for them to, to be more involved in this process? Number one, taking in consideration that Obviously, many of our families or individuals who have been impacted by COVID, who has been one or, or, or in another indirectly impacted by COVID, was not aware of this public hearings that it happened most recently. Um, and then in addition to that, knowing that not everyone can travel to the Capitol, what we have learned uh, about this process during the past pandemic. Well, yeah, Joanne. Well, uh, I'll, I'll speak first. Uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the redistricting process per se, um, one thing is that I think in, in terms of uh, public engagement in general during the pandemic, 
I think that uh, we have learned about uh, the, the fact that tools like the one we're on right now, these virtual tools are here to stay. And the, uh, the General Assembly has used uh, those uh, virtual tools. Um, they are necessary, but they're not sufficient. And so in terms of um, you know, that public input throughout peace along with the, the, uh, in the league's position on redistricting, part of that means a proactive, affirmative, um, actions, actions with an S at the end, on the part of the General Assembly to reach out, to provide more information, to uh, construct a public information campaign, to really engage uh, the public in ways that they have not. This, the redistricting process in Connecticut is bipartisan, and that is certainly better than uh, in states where the, the process is, is partisan, it's one part, controlled by one party. But it is not, it's, 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 it can be improved. And one way that it can be improved is through a, a conscious plan of action to engage uh, the public and not just to sit back and wait for people to show up to uh, testify, but rather, as I said, to uh, uh, develop and then undertake a, a campaign. And organizations like the League of Women Voters and other organizations would certainly um, be benef would would help in, uh, in trying to get that information across. So that's uh, that's something that comes to mind right off the top of my head. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So in, in terms of figuring out how to, how to get really people involved, I think one of the things that we've kind of talked about in this process is, is really holding individuals accountable. Like, yes, it's a bipartisan process, but how can we, how did we only end up with four hearings, right? Who, who made that call and why just four? I think if COVID has taught us anything through this 2020 census is there is no excuse to not have people engaged, right? Like you can do in-person if people feel comfortable, you can do remote, you can do telephone, like the technology is available. There is now no sort of, I won't say no barrier because internet still can be a barrier to some communities, but um, there's no excuse anymore to really limit the engagement from the public, right? It doesn't have to be an in-person hearing, right? Um, it can be webcasted and you can have people from all over the state. Um, so I think really there's now no excuse anymore and, and holding elected officials accountable means four is not enough, four hearings are not enough. Are, are these hearings being held only in the evenings? Maybe sometimes ha someone has a, uh, a night shift, right? Or is there an opportunity for a hearing on a Sunday or a Saturday? Um, we had that in, for example, in New York where they held one hearing on a Sunday um, because it makes a difference. Being accessible to the community makes a difference. Um, another idea that we've you know, kind of talked about a little bit more is wondering whether if this process, if redistricting was conducted by people and not politicians, would people be more engaged, right? If we had redistricting commissions that were formed by, by voters uh, to redraw the districts, would that mean that the process would be a little bit more engaging than just having elected officials draw districts? Um, and it's something that we've talked about here and there, kind of figuring out it, it's really difficult to set them up. Uh, constitutional barriers really limit our ability to just create independent or citizen commissions like they have in some states. Um, but that is also thinking about whether this is the best process. Um, does it always yield um, the most participation from the public? And maybe it's also a time to reconsider uh, how the process is currently being laid out. And I would add to that, uh, Fulvio, that was absolutely correct. I would add to that, that one of the, um, one of the things that the league advocated for after the maps came out was that uh, the legislature take up a bill. We proposed a bill to study uh, redistricting uh, processes and how to integrate uh, more of that uh, transparency and input in uh, to the process in Connecticut. Now that uh, this is of course the short session and that bill was not called, uh, but I do think that that would be a great way and it would keep uh, interest in uh, redistricting going in this interim. One of the things that we can't do is just, you know, let things fall to the wayside. And I think you've already, speakers have already spoken to this, try to gear up, you know, a couple of years in advance. We need to have some ongoing uh, kind of attention uh, brought to this. And then uh, I also just want to emphasize that in terms of um, uh, independent commission, were we to be able to move in that direction, in addition to uh, voters, we would really want to get representatives from all communities, all communities, 
the the a representative is is there to represent all the people in their district. It doesn't whether they're children and of course they're not voters, regardless of what their status is, they're there to represent everyone. And so um, to get that message across, that it's a, a, a project, a need, uh, just like Fulvia said, for all the citizens, to, and see, not just citizens, everyone, to get, um, to get engaged in, in uh, government. We all have a voice and uh, it is important to use it. Thank you. It is important. And, and, and talking about voices, we have two questions from Q, uh, from Taryn, actually. One, the first question is, uh, for you guys, for the panelists, uh, do you think that the similarly new use of communities of interest by the 2021 Redistricting Commission as a frame in redistricting conversation is a step forward towards a more fair redistricting in the future? Now, I'll, I'll just speak to that uh, quickly. I mentioned that the People Power Fair Maps campaign was a nationwide uh, campaign of the league. And so that meant we heard a lot from different uh, voices. And, and we met regularly, we met once a month to talk about, uh, you know, how things were going, what challenges, etc. And one of the things that came up in our last uh, um, uh, conversation was that this concept of community of interest is also a challenge. It's a, a great idea, but it is hard to, it's not well operationalized. And uh, so so in, in regards to what I was uh, just talking about with the idea of a task force to study how to engage uh, the public and how to better undertake um, redistricting, you know, that could be a really important topic. And I could imagine, um, uh, you know, engaging um, social scientists and others on a, on, uh, in some way to, to help us uh, better operationalize this idea of communities of interest. Thank you, Yuan. Um, we have another question, um, and this is uh, more um, around the automatic voter registration. Um, the legislature in 2020 uh, moved forward to codify and expand automatic voter registration beyond the DMV to other states' agencies, beginning with, but beyond the Department of Social Services. Uh, do you see any successful prioritization? of implementation or implementing the automatic voter registration beyond the DMV uh, to increase voter registration in the Latino communities? And I will say yes. I, I, I will say that um, in terms of, of course, we do want automatic voter registration, but more importantly, what we want to make sure is that um, this access is available to all individuals. And um, not many people, not, I mean, not everyone goes to the DMV, right? Um, not every um, community has the potential access for transportation, for private transportation. So it is important that throughout the social services, human services, different departments in the government and outside the government, uh, these um, opportunities are available to everyone. Um, so that is a, 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 a good way to improve and to increase the voter registration, but we cannot just rely on that. Um, there is another question. What do you think are the main factors behind low turnout of Latino voters and how can this be, how can this best be addressed? Dorian or Fulvia? I can take a, a first stab at it. And um, so, so I think there's a couple of things. I think one is, removing any sort of misconceptions or, or myths, right, around the Latino community that they're not engaged, right, that they don't really care about the elections, that they don't really care about voting and so forth. That is just not true. Uh, one of the things that we've seen consistently with the research is that Latinos are engaged, that they are listening, that they are looking to continue to be involved, uh, whether it's voting, whether it's, um, you know, anything, you know, beyond that, whether it's getting counted in the census, right, uh, one of the key things, however, that is always missing when we see it across all different states, all different jurisdictions, is that the Latino community isn't really engaged, right? And meaning that they're not, uh, 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 campaigns or, or otherwise are not spending the resources to, be, to, to actually engage a, a community that wants to be engaged. 
Um, the other thing too is the fact that it has to be meaningful, right? I think some, you know, I think we were talking about being having that engagement be meaningful, not just a, a transactional uh, um, uh, engagement where you know you probably do it during an election. An election's coming, let's just sort of ramp up. Now we're done with it, and now we can just move on to another state or whatever it may be or whatever is of interest. I think I, you know, one of the things you have to do, and it's really critical, is have that sustained engagement over time. And this is where it's really critical, not only for the Latino population as a whole, but certainly for the young, younger Latino population that are really looking for that and looking for that meaningful engagement, that engagement that really is going to have an impact in their daily lives, not just necessarily hearing a, a, a sort of the talking points and then just sort of being dismissed for the next two or four years, depending on what election they're being asked to, to participate in. So I think that's going to be really key and continue to be key moving forward with regards to that. And I think this is just another connection to, uh, um, uh, you know, the question, the prior question around the automatic voter registration. You know, there, the, you know, there's a lot of research that suggests that, may, you know, that, that it might have a, a positive impact on, on different communities with regards to, to voting. You know, one of the things that I could speak to, however, is really around the idea of making things a lot easier for, for, for communities to, to, uh, that are eligible to register to vote. And not only to register to vote, but also making it easier to vote. You know, adding additional layers, adding things that um, certain individuals might not have to be able to cast a ballot, and it is their right to do so, is not the ideal thing, right? It's just something that is just not 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 going to work. It's going to make things a lot harder for a community that is already looking for additional information and and what the process is. You know, we've done some research in different states that really sort of illustrate this, right? This idea that uh, Latinos do want this information, uh, that, that they do want to know how to register to vote. And if there is an option to uh, mail in their ballot, how do you do that? You know, taking them through that process. And I think Yanitsi mentioned this earlier with regards to really uh, um, um, uh, having understanding that process, right? And, 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 and really giving them the information that they're gonna be, that they're gonna have that is gonna be necessary for them to do the things that, 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 you know, that, that certainly will make them um, you know, more active in the political and elect electoral process. And I wanted to pause for a minute, Dorian. I think that's exactly what we're looking for, that type of answers, right? And, and, and just really to have a robust conversations all around the redistricting, that different type of impacts and involvements. Um, but I wanted to say thank you to the, <clears throat> our participants who have been uh, sharing comments and questions. We appreciate that. We are almost at the end of our uh, virtual event. And I really wanted to give you that one minute to each one of you if you want to go over any final thoughts before we close our event today. I just want to say, uh, you know, I think just having something that Doreen mentioned, aside from making sure that we are continuing to grow as a community to register to vote, we also have to be stay aware of barriers to voting, like closing of polling sites, language accessibility, um, different forms of voter registration, absentee ballots, same day voter registration. Those are things that can be put in place or things that we should be aware of to make sure that even when we are growing as a population, even when we are registering, there are no obstacles that are placed that really prevents us from being able to exercise that right to vote. Thank you, Fulvia. And I think as a coalition, um, you know, Hispanic Federation as, as, as well as Latino Justice and many other organizations, but really for the Latino community in particular, we have been leading those type of conversations, right? And advocating for those services Voter access is important and it goes not only to a polling place, it's about language access, it's about the convenience of people to really go out of work or wherever they live so they can um, cast their votes. Um, and, and I think that is crucial and we need to continue to educate our community so they know their rights, they know what are their, the opportunities out there for them to, to go out and vote and also to have a minimal vote and knowing understanding the political process, how to study um, uh, the elected officials who are running for office and things that are impacting their neighborhoods, their community, their state. Um, but then again, I wanted to give another minute to Joan or Dorian for final thoughts. I'll just, I'll just say uh, thank you so much again for inviting us. Uh, the League of Women Voters uh, does have a lot of resources. And as I said earlier, this conversation has really inspired me to 
uh, to to want to have additional conversations with all of you about how we can uh, get this information out there in the best way to a wide variety of uh, communities. Um, uh, the Connecticut um, laws on voting are uh, quite uh, some of the most restrictive in the country. Uh, and, uh, that, and that is also because it, they are embedded in our constitution. Uh, this fall on November 8, we have an opportunity in Connecticut to bring early voting, uh, a process that helps with voter engagement. It allows in-person voting on days other than uh, the election day. We have an opportunity to agree to change the constitution to allow our gen general assembly to create procedures around that. And the league supports uh, that uh, referendum question. It will be on the Connecticut ballot. And uh, we, we urge all uh, Connecticut voters uh, to vote in favor of um, that referendum qu question on early voting. I'll be Thank really you. brief. Uh, you know, I think one of the key things is, is knowing that, you know, certainly the redistricting process, you know, happens every 10 years. Um, one of the key things, however, is that there are a lot of things that happen in between, right? Uh, one is the preparation for 2030's decennial census. Um, how do we, we improve to ensure that the undercount uh, is, is, is mitigated, minimized, removed completely? Certainly being part of that process is really critical. Certainly within the purview of, of voting and so forth, how do we remove as many barriers as possible to ensure that Latinos do have an opportunity to, to you know, cast a ballot, uh, register to vote, that sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, processes, if you will, that are really key uh, to the Latino community and, and continuing to, to ensure that they have a voice in, in, in the process. And I think there are many other aspects of it that, that I think my, my, my clear point is really that, that between now and, and certainly you know, uh, the next uh, uh, census is really all the work that goes into it and the preparation that goes into it and, and being involved in that process and having a voice in that process, I think is gonna be really key. Dorian, absolutely. It's going to be key and we need to continue to, to have these conversations because um, this is an ongoing process, right? It never ends. It's like you restart the engine as soon as you end the, <laughs> the other uh, part of it. And um, we are so happy, so grateful to have you guys here with us this morning. I'm also thankful on behalf of the Hispanic Federation. Thank you for all the participants who have joined us today. I want to also highlight that backstage we have Selena Marte, our program coordinator in Connecticut, and also David Castillo in DC, um, our communications uh, manager, providing support for this event. I also want to highlight uh, the participation and collaboration of CT Connecticut Network, who has been streamlined this virtual event on their channel. Um, it is important that, yes, we continue to have these conversations, we educate our communities, but also those nonprofit organizations who are in the front and center of our communities across the state are involved. Um, and not only are involved, uh, but they're also engaged and they're being considered as trusted voices to really educate and influence our communities. And we have seen that that is one of the best ways to partner. That is one of the best ways for really to reach out to those different um, communities that not necessarily um, have access to information for whatever reason, right? Uh, but it is important that we always take in consideration that building coalitions and working with networks and nonprofit organizations and institutions that serve the community is one of the best ways to really get input on the redistricting uh, process but most important also, um, it, taking them in consideration, their voices, taking them in consideration uh, to draw those lines. Um, I would say that if you want to get the recording of this event, by all means, please visit our website, our YouTube channel for Hispanic Federation. Hispanic Federation is the nation premier Latino nonprofit membership organization. We were founded in 1990. And we have offices here in the state of Connecticut. Hispanic Federation seeks to empower and advance the Hispanic community, support Hispanic families, and strengthen Latino institutions through work in areas like economic empowerment, education, health, immigration, and of course, civic engagement. 
This has been one of the theories of the Hispanic Federation Redistricting Academy, which started in October of 2021. We started with a series of workshops and trainings around redistricting 101, how to build winning coalitions, how to design an advocacy campaign for redistricting, redistricting outreach, and of course, the, the last phase of it, redistricting state updates, which is one of the series that we're hosting today. You can see once again, all our uh, series and our YouTube channel, and we recommend you to please follow us on the social media. There you will see the information of our panelists and the representation of their organizations. And once again, if you want to receive updates or news, please make sure that you register to get our newsletters. That's all from our end. It's 11 o'clock in the morning and we made it. Thank you so much and have a great day.